So I'm back from my appointment with the blood lady, as I call her, because she does live blood cell analysis. And she recently added this hair analysis test to her repertoire. So I thought I would go and give it a try. And I've seen her twice before in the last 10 years. And I'm always impressed with her wisdom and she's always learning more and more she's not the type to just get her little technique and just sit back but it was kind of funny because i had emailed her and i forgot that i emailed her and she said oh i read your email i said i don't even remember what i put and then she told me i put stuff about bipolar so she was saying do you struggle more with anxiety or depression and I said, I actually, my main thing is psychosis. And then I told her about some stuff that might have precipitated it six years ago. And I told her how I have this tendency to dissociate. How I'll have this slight sense that I'm me, but I'll also feel like I'm a homeless person. And then I'm terrified. And I told her a few other little tidbits. And then... It was really funny because she looks at me and says, it could be something else. It could be parallel realities. And I was just laughing on the inside because the stuff she went on to talk about is exactly what I've been talking about to myself over the last number of months. And so I told her that, hey, that's actually how I see it. I was just sort of speaking in the language that most people understand it by. She said that I shifted into a different world. And then she talked about how we're in more than one world at once and and there's this quantum physicist named Cynthia Larson who wrote a book called Quantum Jumps. So she wrote a book about how the brain can jump reality. We can jump states, we can be in different realities, how we're connected, we're non-local. And she said quantum means connected. So quantum consciousness would be a different way to say trans consciousness in a way. I already feel like consciousness is holographic and it's a quantum computer. I haven't really talked that much about it because I don't really know that much about it. But when I saw that little bit about the superposition, it made me feel like there's 16 realities existing simultaneously. And then when our brain quantumly computes it, it collapses the wave function around the probability of the resonance that we were at. It's almost like we have 16 heads. It just depends which head is looking and, and it moves us in that direction and we're moving around like that. So it seems like she, this woman, Cynthia Larson, is another person writing about this experience that people have in consciousness, in reality. The fact that reality isn't static, it, it's fluid, it's dynamic. And then some people go into this fluid and dynamic state and the people that aren't in the fluid and dynamic state observe those people and collapse the wave function around those people being mentally ill. To me, the people that are calling us mentally ill are the people that actually need to grow and recover. Recover from being so linear and being so localized in their consciousness and, and their eyes and their vision. We're actually medicating people out of having these quantum jumps happen. So I find it really interesting. There's all these normal people trying to re research getting into these quantum jumping states, these flow states, and whatever you want to call it. Yet the people that go there uncontrollably, because that's the only way you can go there. You can't go there by control, per se. You can start to learn the rules. A person that goes there without control actually needs to learn the rules of how to actually remain in regular consciousness. 
So how to not flow, how to not quantum jump. Whereas people that are normal are finding these laws of consciousness through physics, through research, through looking at people in extreme sports and, and measuring their metrics of things. Because these are the people, the scientists have been trained to research this stuff and they have all this pay, and they've invested all this money in learning how to research and then they learn how to research consciousness or they learn how to research flow and they look at those people that are flowing in their bodies through mastering gravity through some kind of extreme sport and then they think well how can I do that the I can't do that the I is the ego and that's linear and that other state is non-linear and so since the I can't do that it's something else that does that and that something else can come in and do it whether the I likes it or not and when that happens it's called mental illness so I'm just not understanding why people aren't extrapolating this to people that go into these extreme states of consciousness organically and help them learn how to manage those extreme states of consciousness and learn how to walk between two worlds instead of saying you're defective, we're going to chemicalize you, we're going to medicate you, we're going to throw all these toxins in your body so you don't go in those states. Meanwhile, I'm going to go over and read a book on how to flow. I'm a psychiatrist making lots of money, medicating people, and then I'm going to go and read a book on flow and how to get in these flow states. When I'm medicating flow states, I'm not saying that there's people doing that per I'm just trying to give an example of how it's hypocritical and it's ridiculous and how supposed mental illness is too much flow, it's overflow, it's over quantum computation and one has to actually learn how to slow their brain down. If the brain has gone into hyper learning and hyper perception and then we come back down to the level of reality that most people are at and it seems like the dinosaur age. And our brains want to go at a million miles an hour, yet we're in this dinosaur perception of things. And so it looks like we can't function when really our minds are functioning at a higher level. But it just appears that it's not. And if we can't function, it's like tripping over the rocks of all the dinosaur artifacts that we've placed in this reality that we think have some kind of value like nine to five jobs and all this crap and all this competition and all this brutality and then we wonder why a person who has just come back from inner space travel can barely move in this reality it's because this reality is like molasses for somebody whose brain is super hyper perceptive and then person is medicalized and medicated and then they're even more like molasses and then regular people think that they've done this person a favor I just don't like how these elements of consciousness are being discovered by research and then put into how-to steps when there's so many people out there who need to know how not to And if the people who went into flow spontaneously didn't get pathologized but were unconditionally loved and held for their brains to integrate back into the consensus speed, we would be able to walk together hand in hand to that beautiful world that we're all trying to perceive instead of having some people pushed to the margins of society and then the ones that manage to function in this insane society and have the money then go on to learn how to flow it's messed up regular people go into jobs making money off the people that are in flow and medicate them and then use that money to go off and learn how to be in flow or higher states of consciousness, or better this, or better that. 
the better exists without us having to try to do anything. And that happens to people. And then they fall back into the gravity of this gravitational field of this level of consciousness of seeing things and have stories to tell and things to say and things to share but are not listened to. They're just labeled. So yeah, partly annoys me that there's all of this wonderful spirituality out there. People are like, how do I get to that spiritual place? And again, flow or quantum jumps, I don't feel are for personal gain. There's no such thing as personal gain. It's interesting, I was talking in a video earlier today about cold water and getting used to the cold water. And the lady I talked to today talked about how cold water is so good for you. She talked about this lady who did research and, and helped a lot of people cure different ailments just by putting really cold water on their crotch. Now that is out there, but I think that's awesome. And I'm going to try it. That's definitely something a manic would do. And it's funny too, she actually said, it could be that you're special. And I don't necessarily think I'm special, but it's not often to find a practitioner where you say that you have a diagnosis of bipolar disorder and they say it's a different dimension, it's alternate realities, it's parallel realities, and you're special. And the hardships you experienced that perhaps spurred some of this could be just a gift. And to look into things like quantum jumping. I do like discovering the ways that people are talking about it in these empowering ways. I just really wish that it was extrapolated to supposed mental illness. And I don't know about all the supposed mental illnesses, I don't really know enough about all the labels, but things like psychosis, bipolar, schizophrenia, where people experience psychosis, like weirdness. This weirdness, it's all properties of consciousness. And consciousness is exploring consciousness, and consciousness is discovering the properties and the rules of consciousness. And we think they are a hits B and B hits C and it goes on like that but it's it's not a billiard ball universe it's the quality of one's consciousness and then I was watching another video about a guy and I didn't watch the whole thing I couldn't really watch it I didn't really resonate with him though I'm sure I resonated with what he said but he was talking about increasing your frequency and I, I'm and I didn't watch far enough to discover how he said to go about doing that. I still feel, though, that there is a slight difference between trying to increase one's frequency through effort, through will, through motivation, through drive, through that mode is egoic and any movement of the ego is going to actually lower the frequency so the frequency of the ego might be able to get to a certain height by thinking lovely thoughts but i don't feel that that changes the brain in the same way that direct perception in the moment and understanding does. So I might think some kind of positive affirmation. It's going to change the brain a bit, but I don't think it's going to create a stage. It might create a state which has some value only if from that state we then act different. So if I create a state in my brain by saying some positive affirmation that is a certain level and I just sit there and enjoy that state and then 
continue to sit there and then it kind of wears off and then I get up and go about my day. I don't think that really does much of anything. It might temporarily reduce the stress in the brain or something like that, but it's not the same as embodied action. It's not the same as giving it a voice out loud because then there's more input. You're actually moving your mouth and you're saying the words, you're actually hearing the words. Um, and in self-dialogue, I see myself say it when I watch the video afterwards. So there's more inputs. Whereas, and I feel that's a stronger vibration. When the vibration is actually coming out of us and then going back through us, it's more powerful than if we're just having that vibration create images and words in our consciousness. That's what the ego does. And that's the very thing that's preventing us from direct perception. So if we're constantly doing things like that to sort of self-medicate our brain, it's, it, will do, it will do something, but it's not the same as actually seeing. So I can work myself into a positive state through that process of visualization and saying stuff in my own head and then go about my crappy life as it is for the next 20 years and then afterwards think, holy crap, I just lived a life I didn't want to live because I was working myself into a trance. That's the same as taking a pill to go about my crappy life. Now it's different to actually be so present, be so clear, be so perceptive that I see the crap and get rid of it. And by getting rid of the crap, it makes space for something else. And then something else continues to unfold. And then all of a sudden, I'm walking out a life that I don't need to create some kind of precondition in my mind in order to be one with. And I'm not saying state change isn't valuable. I'm just pointing out its limited value. Because if we're always thinking we need new methods to change our state, for example, if I have a certain method to change my state into a happy state, eventually I'm going to be adapted to that. And I'm going to need something new to be able to do the same thing. And so I haven't actually done anything real in my brain except get it habituated to something. And it's created sort of a scar in my brain. So now I have to create some new habit, some new program, some new protocol in order to create another scar in my brain. And then when that scar gets old and boring, so it becomes another dopamine reflex in my view. And there's a lot of talk about visualization. And even this woman the quantum physicist talks about visualizing and I actually never visualize anything I don't see anything in my head I I don't see anything I don't see any images or have any thoughts and that gives me access to insight which is something subtle which is a gentle and subtle form that forms inside that informs me what I'm seeing and what to say. But if I have that clogged up with my own visualizations, I'm not going to see what's right there in front of me. I feel like it's possible the only real power that visualization really has is if we happen to visualize something that is congruent with what the mind wants to, us to create. So Dr. Daniel Siegel says, the mind uses the brain to create itself. Well, right now, the brain is being used by thought to create what thought thinks should be created. But when we decouple from that, we're in touch with perception each moment, which creates the action we do, which 
moment by moment will unfold a different world when we're in touch with that. Now, if we're sitting here visualizing, we're not in touch with direct perception. Yet, people who go into map consciousness, they actually get the imprint, the blueprint from the universe, the download of what it is we're here to create. And that could be a reason why we can be more in touch with direct perception afterwards as we go throughout life, as long as we're not medicated into a stupor because we've already seen it. So it's it's a, a different kind of moving towards the mind. We've seen what the mind wants to tell us and then we go backwards in time in order to move towards unfolding that. So if somebody's visualizing and they're visualizing themselves on a cruise and whatever and then all of a sudden they visualize something about homeless people being fed could be that by visualizing that and that's part of what the mind wants us to create there'll be some kind of power in that visualization so the more bits of one's visualization of one's desire that's in alignment with the collective mind of what we're here to unfold collectively as humanity like a colony of ants creating an anthill in all the tunnels we similarly are one consciousness that is unfolding something together. And I don't know if that's true about the visualization. It's still an act of will. We don't need will to see. Seeing just happens and when we happen to see something else happens that doesn't require will. It's a subtle difference but even with all this flow stuff and this other stuff, it's all being sold for personal gain. And when somebody goes there organically through the transconscious process and is thrust into it, there's no time to even think about personal gain. It's it's full immersion without thinking, I'm doing this step one because it's going to make me feel better. And step two, this is going to make me look better. And step three, this is going to make me more productive. And step four, no, it's just full immersion. You don't know the rules. You don't know all these rules of consciousness and how it works like they're trying to say to us now through flow and quantum jumps and all that. It's we already jumped. And now we've come back from the quantum. Those of us that come back, not everybody comes back. Some people see, oh, there's nothing left for me to do here. I'll be living in the light body realm with the rest of the people who were brave enough to cross over. And then those of us that don't have something to do, but that's turned into being drugged. And the world doesn't see what it's doing to its fallen angels. And I'm not surprised because adults who go through this get drugged, children get drugged. People who go through this process make other people uncomfortable. And then those very same people who are uncomfortable are like, oh, look at this thing about flow. I think another benefit of self-dialogue is making my body real by seeing myself more. The phone becomes a witness. It becomes a collapser of the wave function. Because if I'm alone, with consciousness. Consciousness can go anywhere. And at least this is me talking about consciousness going somewhere else while being here now. So it's in a way it's existing in both worlds. It's a way of walking between the worlds. It's a way of walking in this world and consciousness walking in another world and then walking myself and maybe other people through it. 
because it would be lovely if normal people could get into quantum consciousness, if they could get into flow, and if more and more of them are in flow, when us spontaneous leapers go into that dimension, there'll be more people to talk to. And there'll be more of us already up there. Could almost be that those of us who are medicated have to wait for more people to go up there before we can join you. We kind of have to hold down the fort down here in the old. The thing is, if we were released from our chemical prisons, the consciousness level of humanity would level up significantly if people were more understanding, not of mental illness, but just of consciousness in general and the powers of the human brain and learning and neuroplasticity. The problem is that humanity is just too stupid. So medications are only valuable in that they slow down the quantum computation by changing the amount of information we can see in our visual field. We compute by seeing. 